Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Tom Ford, and I'm one of the chairs and organizers of Grand Rounds. And Leslie Crichton, my partner in crime, is in the audience here as well. Um, today, uh, Grand Rounds is a, has a focus on sustainability. And I'm very pleased that uh, Pavan Bangalore, who is the chair of the NHS Tayside Sustainability Steering Group, is back to Grand Rounds to tell us about the progress that's been made with the efforts in terms of sustainability in the in the health board um he's going to speak for i think 25 minutes half an hour um he's asked me if i'll give an update on uh, some inhaler chat because we're, i'm doing some work with scottish government uh, and also in the health board um looking at our inhaler prescribing and i'll explain more about why that's so important a bit down the line um, and we're hopeful that if uh, if you that there'll be a bit of audience participation and that you'll be able to give either give some ideas to Pavan about um, projects that you're doing that we don't know about, things that you've highlighted in your own practice that could really be that need some focus and attention, or, or maybe just some feedback on how things are going. Um, and we're talking about sustainability and in in its largest sense. Uh, so we're including you know recycling, carbon footprint, global warming potential, healthy living air quality, green spaces, every, all of that thrown together. So uh, if you have any ideas or things you want to talk about, please, uh, please do speak up. So uh, usual rules apply. Keep your uh, microphones muted unless you're speaking. Um, and Pavan will share his screen. Any questions, put them in the chat or uh, I'll wait till the end. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, I'm just going to be kind of updating about um, an environmental sustainability and uh, uh, I'm an anesthetist. And if you're wondering uh, what an anesthetist is uh, going to talk about an environmental sustainability, hopefully in the next 20, 25 minutes, you'll be convinced that uh, we are doing our bit and, uh, and hopefully uh, that'll um, bring some newer ideas on, on, on the table. Um, so this was originally um, meant to be kind of a surgical focus um, uh, and we were supposed to do a double act. Uh, Jay Manik, one of the ENT um, uh, consultant surgeons, he was supposed to join me, but unfortunately he's had some sort of family illness which he had to attend and uh, he couldn't be a, a part uh, of this today. So uh, I'm just going to be giving an update um, uh, from the anesthetic point of view and a little bit of general chat, including something called Green Theatre Project, which is uh, uh, going on quite well, Scotland wide, uh, led by um, uh, one, one of my anaesthetic colleagues in Rakemore. His name is Dr. Ken Barker. So I'll, I'll describe it briefly uh, as we go along. Um, uh, uh, so is, if I'm not, uh, if you can't hear me, if you can't see the slide, just, just give a shout uh, and I'll just uh, carry on at the moment. Um, as I said, I'm one of the anaesthetists and I also chair the sustainability steering group in Tayside. Um, so uh, currently, um, it, it's a bunch of people with, with interest in sustainability. So we don't have a dedicated team for sustainability yet, but that's our aim, and hopefully that will happen um, uh, soon in our health board. Um, so I'm just going to move the slide. There you go. So um, I, I kind of uh, put this slide up to say, what do I say to do? I use this slide uh, to um, ask this question um, during my medical student teaching. Um, so some of you may know, anesthetists love coffee and uh, half our department um, are amazing cyclists. So uh, apart from that, we do a little bit of sustainability work as well. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that, um, ignore this slide. Uh, so I use that um, menti.com uh, with some of the students uh, asking this question about how they feel about environmental crisis. Uh, such as climate change and uh, I was not expecting to see this uh, particular uh, kind of um, uh, slide which is uh, the word cloud here. Uh, I thought they'll be filled with hope and they'll be very optimistic but unfortunately not. Uh, the, the biggest word you can see there is worried um, and things like doomed, um, helpless, anxious, uh, annoyed, uh, urgent, upset, disaster. So uh, this is uh, around 25 to 30 students um, who are going to be uh, probably the, the, yeah, who are going to be doctors um, uh, sometime this year. So that, that kind of, I mean, really opened my eyes to that, gosh, um, people are definitely worried because I was thinking these youngsters will be much more hopeful and they'll be, um, uh, they'll be far more optimistic. 
um, but, um, more optimistic than me, uh, but uh, it turned out to be the other way. Um, one of the things that really struck me in the last couple of years is when I kind of learned the contribution um, that we um, um, do as a global healthcare. I mean, if you divide the world based on the countries who contribute to carbon footprint, uh, global healthcare is the fifth biggest country. So that just explains the scale of problem here. And then so many things we can we can um, do slightly differently and uh, make an impact positively uh, on the environmental sustainability. Uh, uh, so I'm sure some of you would have seen this slide. Um, it, it's a no-brainer. There's a um, great link between health and climate, so they, they kind of help each other. If the, if you have, um, uh, you probably would have heard about um, worsening asthma um, and other respiratory conditions in areas like London, and you probably would have heard of uh, New Delhi, um, the smog, which kind of the pollution, air pollution is absolutely a massive problem. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, contributors is uh, obviously um, uh, climate change. So if you look after our climate, indirectly we're, we're, all, we're all going to be looking after our health. And that this slide quite nicely explains all that. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it's, it's a good one to look at. Um, um, it kind of explains quite nicely. Um, Hotspots is um so um quite nicely uh, the, the areas where um there's a um, good contribution towards um carbon carbon footprint in healthcare has been kind of divided so if you see here on the slide hopefully you'll be able to see, see the arrow here uh, the kind of contribution done by medicines medical equipment uh, supply chain mainly nhs carbon footprint personal travel uh, so what I'm going to concentrate here is about NHS carbon footprint, mainly about waste, anesthetic gases. Uh, I know Tom's going to mention about meter dose inhalers. Um, uh, and there's a lot of work happening about uh, travel, especially the business travel and NHS fleet in NHS stateside. And also there's some work happening at uh, building energy. So it, these are all hot spots where um, we can make sub, uh, subtle changes, small changes, and, and bring the change uh, in a positive way. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be concentrating mainly on. Um, again, some of you may have um, seen this. In April 2019, uh, Scottish government declared climate emergency. Um, so, and also you may have heard um, uh, uh, hospitals like Newcastle, they've actually declared a climate emergency as well. But Scottish NHS uh, decided to take a slightly different tack. So we being in NHS, we kind of respond to emergency and not declare it. So that, that's the kind of approach um, NHS Scotland has taken towards climate, um, uh, climate change. So there are six initial climate change commitments, which um, all the chief executives of all NHS boards signed up to. Um, so one is we need to achieve net zero by 2045. It feels like uh, a long time, 22 years, but it's actually not. There's so much to do. Um, all the new buildings and major refurbishments, uh, they all need to be designed to uh, stick to the regulations to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the new tech center that's coming up in Perth, I think is, is uh, um, sticking to that um, uh, rule. Also, we need to do a risk assessment uh, annually and submit it to the Energy Scotland. Um, and, and that happens, I think, a few of us, including uh, Rod Mountain, myself, and Philip Wilde, and Emily Stevenson, one of the consultants in public health, we actually went through the questions to uh, answer some of the risk assessment questions. It's quite complex, uh, which I hadn't appreciated until I um, went into it. Um, like I mentioned, transport, that needs to become more green by 2025. That's like in two years' time, so that's, there's not much time at all. Supply chain, like I said, it contributes to almost 70% of carbon footprint uh, in health. And uh, um, uh, that's one of the things that a lot of work is happening at the moment, but we're still um, uh, not there. Um, and each board uh, should establish a climate change sustainability group to oversee the transition to a net zero emission service. So we have a group and uh, I'll, I'll show you what the group looks like but um, um, it, it's, it's currently filled with volunteers as opposed to a dedicated team. Um, so that's the, that's the group. 
and we the, the brand name is heat if you're wondering where the a comes from is it's a is hidden in sustainability so it's healthcare and environmental sustainability in tay side um so the few of us all the names are uh, kind of uh, written here and like i said uh, um, none of us are full time into this uh, so we do these things in our own time and when we get time so that's the big challenge um it, you may have seen newcastle achieve amazing success because they have a really good team of I think six or seven people maybe it's increased now um who work five days a week um purely on sustainability and they've achieved massive massive success um so this is some of the work that's uh, happened in tayside um so the greenhouse gases and energy management work is happening like i said it's already saved nearly 35000 tons of co2 uh, transport is changed towards using more and more electric vehicles um i think yeah, if i'm if i'm right uh, they're looking into um, finding areas to install electric car charges um there's a lot of work happening in green space nature and biodiversity um a lady called Viola Marks, who's moved to Dundee Council now. So she had done uh, quite a bit of work on it, um, and I think it's been carried on now. Uh, so new compostable coffee cups, they've all appeared in, I think, Aroma and uh, our canteen. Waste management, which I'll discuss about in a minute, because we've got new um, recycling, recycling bins, especially in nine wells. I'm not sure if it's reached Perth and Strakathro yet, but uh, um, we've and spent a lot of money and got these bins, so we need to make good use of it. Uh, I don't think it's working 100% yet, but we're getting there. Uh, active travel and procurement to the other, other few things that's been going on. So, um, like I said, one of my colleagues in uh, Regmore um, Design came up with this idea. It's called Green Theatre Project. So, basically, looked into several areas in an uh, operating theatre and see where uh, where we can make a difference. And it's, this is a slightly older chart, and we're coming up. We've come up with more. Uh, not, we've increased the number of things that where we can influence and reduce the um, carbon footprint. And uh, we've not made a chart yet. So if you can see here, low flow anesthesia, which I'll talk about in a second. Waste segregation, I'll talk about in a second. One of the things is the surgical fluid suction. Uh, there's a system called Neptune suction system, which is makes. I mean. I, and we do use it in um, areas like urology, uh, I think in Perth, uh, if I'm right, because where um, the scope, uh, scope kind of procedures are uh, heavily done. So we need to increase the use of that in, in data system that needs a little bit of um, initial planning and um, implementing this actual system. So it reduces carbon footprint quite significantly. And also um, it's easy to dispose. You don't have to manually um, take the suction bags and empty it elsewhere. So it's uh, the nurses will definitely love it. Um, the other area is the scavenging switch, data the ventilation. There was, we had done a metal recycling trial, which I'll show a slide about, which was a really good success, but for a variety of reasons, it's still not become a reality in NHS Scotland. But I think that's one of the uh, things that's on priority, as, as I understand. Um, um, the, the scavenging switch and data ventilation. Uh, it, it's like leaving the switch on for computers and uh, even the in the lights on. Majority of the times we are um, working only during the weekdays, during the standard working hours, which is between eight and six, and that kind of comprises thirty percent of the whole week. So remaining bit of time, most of the times we're just leaving this on. But uh, again, it depends on the um, how new the hospital is or how how old is the hospital, what kind of system there is. So it's not straightforward but that's one of the things that we need to look at so if you turn them off it automatically saves a lot of energy and a lot of money for the um uh, for the health board and um, similarly scavenging gases so, so we i mean as a um to keep people asleep we use inhalational agents and that that can cause um uh, i mean pollution if you don't scavenge to the atmosphere and that itself causes a problem which i'll mention that in a second but uh, because we are using the scavenging system, it uses electricity and it uh, uses energy. So when we're not using the theta, we need to switch it off so that uh, energy is saved. Fluid warming, there are more efficient warmers that's coming there. Plastic recycling, uh, the simple things like not using the disposable cups, um, uh, the polystyrene cups, they are absolute nightmare. Um, if, I mean, if, if you can get rid of it, I mean, it was up to me, I would just 
get rid of it completely, but it's not so straightforward. But in an ideal situation, I think uh, we sh should not encourage anybody to use it unless it's absolutely indicated. Similarly, the kind of gloves um, uh, uh, we use, um, again, try and reduce the waste. And uh, um, I mean, as you can see here, um, it's 1.4 billion gloves are used across the world. So it's, it's quite a huge number. So there are these are just some of the areas that highlighted in this green data project. Um, and we are looking into other areas as well. And uh, hopefully a, a new kind of infographic will come, uh, come out soon. So just to give you a little bit of science behind inhalation latents, what we're interested in here is this play, at this area, 10,000 meters. Um, area below that is called troposphere, and that tropopause is where uh, mm -hmm. most of the filtering happens. Um, uh, and there are some windows there through which the greenhouse gases escape into the um, atmosphere, um, and, and which is good and which, uh, which should happen. Um, greenhouse gases, are generally good, but the problem is we are producing too much of it. And too much of anything is not, not really good. And that, that's the main problem is those small windows through which the greenhouse gases escape are not enough to clear out all that we are producing. So we're kind of creating a bottleneck, like a massive traffic jam. So it's all just coming back uh, to the Earth's surface. And as anesthetists, how we are contributing is, if you see here, um, just we're gonna move this, my camera there. So if you see on the right hand side the picture, uh, the big arrow here where it says ISO, CO and DES. So that little, um, um, one of the windows I was talking about, talking about through which greenhouse gases escape, the wavelength actually um, correlates with that small window. So what these agents do is they go and block that window, which means it, uh, if it's in significant amounts, thankfully we've not reached there yet. So uh, we've understood this and we are trying to make a difference. Um, but if it completely blocks, then all the greenhouse gases will just be coming back to atmosphere and, and uh, the uh, climate change is going to get worse. So that's the kind of um, yeah, science in brief uh, behind using inhalational agents. Um, and just to give you the scale of the problem, this is in UK, snapshot uh, audit done by a Royal College of Anesthetists. So you can see here the number of cases that we do in, in a year. Uh, a couple of things to highlight here. Majority of them get inhalation agents, which have um, a, um, a negative impact on the environment, unfortunately. Um, and uh, uh, nitrous oxide, which is which is a nasty thing, um, uh, it still being used in one in five uh, patients. And along with contributing to um, uh, contributing to uh, greenhouse gas effect, nitrous oxide also decreases the ozone layer. So it's got a um, it, it, it's really bad, bad news for the environment. So the, this is just to demonstrate, to do the exact same surgery, use different types of anesthesia. So the one right on the extreme left, where we use an inhalation agent called desflurane. So that has the massive, massive carbon footprint. And if you compare that to somebody having just a spinal anesthetic with a little bit of sedation, the difference is massive in terms of carbon dioxide, uh, CO2E. Uh, so this is just to show you the scale of things. And all we need to do is make a small change uh, where we are not going to be using this uh, desflurane and just replace it with either uh, uh, doing a spinal, which is what we more commonly do for knee replacements, um, or if somebody needs a general anesthetic, use um, inhalation agents such as co which is a bit more kinder. Uh, or use total intravenous anesthesia, which is even better. And if the anesthetist involved, if they cycle to work or walk from home to work, um, it reduces the contribution further. And again, I was talking about scavenging system, talking about ventilation system, and also waste management. All these things do contribute to the overall carbon footprint. And this is just one case I'm talking about. So we do thousands and thousands of these cases um, all over the country. Um, Again, just to show you um, the contribution towards carbon footprint, a hospital in Vancouver, they used desflurane mainly. So their biggest contribution to carbon footprint was anesthetic gas. Whereas um, in Minnesota, they were still using desflurane, but not in the same quantity as the Vancouver hospital. So their contribution to carbon footprint was a bit less. Whereas a hospital in um, Oxford, they were using 
uh, either isoflurane or pseudoflurane or total intravenous anesthesia, or possibly even spinal queries or regional anesthesia were indicated. And their contribution um, towards overall carbon footprint is uh, really, really less uh, from the anesthetic side of things. So their main issue is energy. So just, again, just to show you, just by making small changes um, uh, in each area, you can make a difference. Um, and the scale of the problem is, to create one ton of carbon dioxide gas, you have to drive on a daily basis in a standard average petrol car for 46 weeks, uh, and you need to drive around, um, I think, eight, uh, eight, eight and a half miles. Um, but if you want to achieve this quickly, use a bottle of dish food and that creates the same kind of carbon footprint. Um, so that's why we've tried to uh, get rid of this. And then again, similar comparison, nitrous oxide is, um, um, it, the problem is it, it gives, I mean, if you actually convert that into an area, it's equivalent to um, the metropolitan city of Bristol and this fluid is as big as Bedford Town. Um, again, uh, just in, uh, looking at the time, uh, there are different ways to express the um, issue. So I'm not gonna uh, go through these things in detail. So what did we do? Uh, a simple thing like taking off the death flow in Um We took that off initially from most of the theater and left it in a few emergency theaters and we encouraged to use something called low flow. Um, so that really helped and that, um, and also we kind of did some, um, what do you call, uh, not, not advertisement, but just kind of raising awareness on uh, days like clean air day and earth day and that kind of stuff um, to just raise awareness. This was four or five years ago, it actually all made a difference. And if you see here, uh, we compare the use of this desflurane bottles in 2017, we had used 163 bottles. Um, uh, but in 2018, in the same time period, it had come down to 30, uh, 30 bottles. And uh, we thought that may increase the use of seofluorine, but it actually did not. Um, so small changes, it definitely makes a huge difference. And currently, what's been happening? So 2016, um, uh, we were using um, um, more than we were spending more than fifty thousand pounds. Now it's less than five thousand pounds. This is the kind of most updated one. Again, numbers have gone down quite drastically. Um, see, uh, similarly, carbon footprint. If you convert that into miles, I'm not. I'm not even going to make an attempt to tell you. Um, how many miles? Uh, so it's a massive, massive reduction just by making a simple uh, change. Um, so what we've done further is we've taken off all the display and vaporizers, but still um, uh, there, there are some clinical indications um, and, and people like to use it in certain situations, but uh, it's not so common. Um, so we've just stored one vaporizer per theta suite and that gets used uh, when the clinician thinks it's required, and hopefully you'll be able to see the difference in the next year or two. Um, so this is just to show you um, all, all over Scotland, um, um, the, the kind of change that's happened. So you can see the fall in desflurane. During COVID, it had gone up a little bit. We really don't know the exact reason why, but it's again starting to taper. Uh, I was I was fortunate enough to attend COP26 last um, uh, November, during which we uh, made a video that kind of demonstrated all the work that happened in Scotland, and mainly a group of anesthetists. And uh, uh, we highlighted this to the general public, and we had a massive, massive interest uh, from a lot of people. Uh, I still remember one of the uh, elderly gentlemen came and told me, um, oh gosh, I'm shocked to hear all this. Sorry, I've had a, a hip joint replacement, and I thought I was asleep. So maybe he had a spinal and sedation, we don't know. but. Uh, he actually kind of understood the issue there and he came and told me right at the end. Um, and this is the link to the YouTube video if anybody's interested in seeing the work that's happening around Scotland. I'm more than happy to share it through uh, Tom and Leslie. Um, again, simple things, like I said, um, what we all can do is making sure we turn the lights off, we turn the computers off when we're not using it. 11,000 computers in Tayside. So if you just leave a desktop on, it uses 200 watts per hour. So if, um, so ideally, if you're not using it, turn it off completely. Um, and even if you leave it on standby, it still consumes energy and you still waste money and you um, uh, negative impact on the environment. 
So simple solution is when you're not using it, turn it off. Thing to appreciate, like I said, here is Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. is when all these computers get used um, uh, uh, on, a, on a regular basis. And that comprises only 30% of the whole week. So there's a lot we can um, say. Um, this is one of the pictures sent by uh, my clinical lead uh, on one of the weekends. So when we actually did this little, um, like putting stickers against all the switches, um, uh, the whole department, when he walked in on a weekend, I think it was all dark. So he took a picture and shared it on Facebook, I think, on, the, on our group, departmental group. Um, I know um, not all of us read all the vital sign emails that come to our inbox, uh, but there are some really um, um, good ones with a lot of information. So uh, please have a look at them. They tell you what to do in simple steps. So all you have to do is um, just have a read and see what you can um, do and how you can contribute positively. Uh, so one of the things I'm gonna speak briefly about is the waste management. Um, and you can see the amount of waste we generate. And this is slightly old um, data as well. Uh, with COVID, that's worse and significant. And um, so one of the things that I always try and do is if I'm not gonna be needing it, refuse it as in uh, just don't open it in case kind of a thing so uh, we need to think when we for example if i have to open a syringe wrapper or if i have to need a syringe ask myself 100 times do i really need this syringe don't open it and say oh i don't need it just chuck it so uh, i'm just giving an extreme simple example but uh, i think refusing is probably the best way if you, when you don't need it and reduce the use reuse where possible there's a concept called remanufacturing, um, which is actually C marked. Um, it is not taken off big time, but I think it's a infancy status. So what they do is they take all these single use instruments and they uh, used single use instruments like laparoscopic instruments. They sterilize it to the um, st uh, standard that's required by the Scottish government. And then they um, ask people to reuse it. And that obviously reduces cost and reduces uh, carbon footprint. Uh, but it's not taken off yet, but hopefully it'll happen soon. Recycle when we can, and I'll mention, I'll show you the bin um, that, that's come out recently, and some of you would have seen that. And then appropriate disposal is crucial. So if you don't dispose it correctly, uh, and if you don't segregate the waste properly, it's not going to get recycled or it's not going to go into the correct stream, and the whole um, effort is kind of wasted. Um, so yeah, some some over the same information. The thing to highlight here is the uh, amount of money it costs for clinical waste. It's more than 450, 450 pounds. For uh, a black bag, it's just over 100 pounds. So if you put the correct waste into correct bag, you're already saving money. So if you put all the black bag waste into orange bins, then you're already uh, spending three times the money. And this orange waste they just get incinerated, they get burnt. And these orange waste, they leave a byproduct and that byproduct used to go to landfill. Now, thankfully it doesn't go to landfill anymore because they do something called energy from waste. Um, I think they get either exported to Scandinavian countries or some other centers in Scotland and England where they generate energy from it. Similarly, black bag waste, they are not absolutely recyclable, but they uh, contribute to energy from waste. But the stuff that can go into clear bag and they are the ones uh, which get recycled. And um, um, th th there's, th there's, I mean, that, that could generate money as well. And you probably would have heard about a lot of examples where um, they recycle things like including the masks, um, the, the type to our disposable masks, they've been recycling and uh, creating something different. Uh, so th there's, there's, a, um, there's a lot of good ideas that's happening, uh, but it's not, Kind of come into one single, um, as in uh, it's, it's not done a very efficient way, and we have a long way to go to achieve that. Um, yeah, so the recycling bins they look slightly different for staffing areas and the clinical areas. In theatre area, we should be having one um, recycling bin per theatre, so that obviously creates challenges. So where do we place this bin? Um, and and also. Um, in the main theatre, the scrub side um, and the anesthetic side, both of them generate waste. So we should, I mean, we've kind of had discussions with both groups and located in certain areas so that um, most recycling happens in those areas. So those are the bins. 
Um, so the bottom one is the one that uh, uh, appears in the clinical areas, and the top one is uh, the one that appears in the staffing areas. And uh, that's information of what should go in and what shouldn't go in. And this is where segregating waste is so, so, so important. So if you mix these things, the uh, appropriate recycling will not happen. And that is just to show the amount of waste that gets generated um, in a half a day or less than half a day in, in an operating theatre, in one operating theatre. So imagine all this stuff, most of it can be either going to recycling uh, area or black bin. So imagine if all the, all the all of this is gone into clinical waste, which is orange bin, the amount of money you would be wasting and the amount of it, um, uh, the, the contribution towards the carbon footprint. So um, just to remind, refuse, reuse, recycle. Uh, metal recycling trial, um, this, we, we kind of sure if you recycle the metal, um, at the moment, single use uh, metal goes into sharp spin and that gets incinerated. So we tried to recycle it during the trial and that actually saved um, so much metal getting burnt. And that, that uh, um, I mean, you can see the numbers on the screen already. And that's equivalent to um, the weight of uh, one hippopotamus. That was just during six weeks. So if you do this in all the areas, imagine the impact it will have. And hopefully it will happen soon. Um, yeah, so a few, few things that helps me um, uh, to kind of make a, make a difference is plan before you prepare. Just make sure what you need and what you don't need. Waste management, avoid disposable paper attire whenever possible. I understand COVID had caused a bit of problems, but um, it, we just need to think sensibly and practically. Lights, computers, air conditioners, all these kind of things, when it's not being used, they need to be turned off completely, including the switch of the wall, because the electricity can leak if you leave the switches on. Avoid single disposable cups, single use plastic bottles. Think about car share wherever appropriate, but at the moment, because of COVID, I don't think that's been encouraged. Raise awareness, education, I think, if you speak to two more people and mention a few things about this, that might kind of bring up a new idea and you guys might come up with something that, okay, let's do this and make a, make a small difference. Um, paper waste, a quick word about it. Uh, if you're still ordering paper journals, you need to look at alternative options because 20% of the paper doesn't get recycled. Each A4 paper requires five liters of water and every journal approximately has 80 to 100 pages. Uh, uh, that's leaving the plastic wrapper and all the transport and the postal charges that, that it can contribute to. So a massive amount of carbon would put with this. So my journals are all online now and uh, uh, I don't have to worry about taking it to plastic recycling, uh, paper recycling and all, the, all those kind of things uh, that you could save um, by doing a simple switch. Um, just to highlight the problem with polystyrene cups, they are right down at the bottom in that plastic hierarchy, the quality of plastic. So because the quality is so poor, nobody's interested in recycling these. So best solution is uh, not to use them. And I can see they are actually, the studies have shown they cross the placental barrier and the plastic particles pass from mother to fetus. So uh, this, this is an uh, absolute, um, um, I mean, I think nightmare. Uh, so instead of that, use, um, get your own cups, it will give you a nice chance to display some really nice pictures. So there are plenty of resources online, and I've just kind of listed a few here from the anesthetic point of view. Um, but um, and there's one of the infographics that we created um, by myself and one of my colleagues. Uh, his name is Tim Smith. He prominently works in PRI. He's another consultant anesthetist who's uh, um, massively interested in this area. Um, so if any of you need any kind of information, please do get in touch. And if you want to join the sustainability steering group, please do get in touch. Um, so before I kind of finish, just a little trivia, or I mean, this is a worrying numbers. So this is pre-COVID, over nine months, we used less than quarter of a million um, masks. So if you come to COVID times, see the number of masks used in the same period, this was in 2020, which is when I think the hospital had allowed people to use uh, reusable masks um, in certain areas, but now I don't think we can use reusable masks in the hospital at all. So the numbers would have gone up even further. So the carbon footprint has massively increased. So 
yeah, um, just to say, uh, as an anesthetist, I always have plan A, plan B, plan C, um, yeah, but uh, we need to remember there's no planet B. There's only one planet and we need to save it. Thank you very much for some acknowledgements here and look forward to hearing Tom um, talk about inhalers and then hopefully it'll initiate some discussion. I'll stop sharing my, sorry, that's my email ID. And if anybody interested in tweeting, that's my Twitter handle. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much, Pavan. That's uh, it's a huge amount of work. Um, and some of these things you might, I think you may look at that and think, well, that's obviously it's dead obvious. Just put some recycling bins around places, just get on with it. But actually the getting that done has been a huge amount of work um, for a huge amount of reasons, um, which some of which are, are not immediately obvious. So, you know, re recycling, um, the cardboard boxes from uh, for vials of medication in aesthetics. Say you've got a box of full of fentanyl, and you get through the box of fentanyl, you can recycle that. That seems pretty straightforward. But to try to recycle the box of somebody's diltiazem, say that they brought into hospital with them, that has patient identifiable information on it. And there's actually there are steps to go through. To can you actually recycle that, and, and or can you not? And so I think there's a huge amount of work that goes on behind the scenes, which people who are watching may think. So it's just 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 put a green bin and let people use it. But actually, there's a huge amount of, of logistical work that goes into it. And perhaps as a, a demonstration of the complexities involved, I'll just talk just for five minutes, just if you'll indulge me, I suppose, to talk about inhalers. Um, so as a as some for context, I, I, I was the lead clinician for the Respiratory Care Action Plan for Scotland published last year. And I'm now the uh, one of the leads nationally to, to take that plan forward. And one of the things we're doing is sustainability and prescribing, because inhalers um, lead to uh, four percent of the carbon footprint and global warming potential of the NHS. Uh, that might seem well four percent is not very much, but we, the, a huge amount of it is transport costs and delivering things and moving people around and ambulances, which are big ticket items. But 4% um, is actually huge when you consider you know, what, how many people are talking about in Tayside that have got an airways disease that need an inhaler. Roughly uh, about 8,000 people in Tayside have COPD and 30,000, maybe a little bit more than that, have asthma. Um, so that's a chunk of people that are generating 4% of our, of our global oil potential and, and carbon footprint. So who, who do we see? You know, who, who sees these people to try to make the changes? Well, asthma patients are notoriously poor attenders. They don't come to their annual reviews. There are a couple of GPs in the audience. They'll, they'll, I'm sure they'll be nodding away to this. They, you just don't see them. They only see in emergencies when they exacerbate um, and they drop into ED or they could get admitted into here. Um, or there's a big chunk of people with asthma who are actually pretty well. They're on straightforward inhalers that they were started on in 1900 and oatcake. Um, and they're almost entirely MDIs, uh, which are the biggest carbon footprint inhalers. And they, they never turn up to get reviewed to get changed because they're, they're, they're well. And the extra complexity in this is that it's not as straightforward as MDI bad, DPI good. So MDI is a meter dose inhaler with, uh, with a, a, a canister to, of, of uh, compressed gas, which generally have a much higher uh, carbon footprint and then a dpi dry powder inhaler which has just that dry powder inside a device which you there's no propellant it's the inhalation which which uh, causes that allows it to, to work so dpis are, are much much lower carbon footprint because they don't have that gas but not all mdis are the same so for an example uh ventolin which is the salbutamol um but specific salbutamol made by gsk ventolin that's what everyone remember everyone knows about ventolin comes in an EVA inhaler, and one of those inhalers has the same environmental impact as driving a car about 200 miles. But if you use the um, Salamol, which is a generic version of the same drug, just made by a different company, uses a different propellant in a different kind of canister, then you can drop that down to about 50 miles in a car. And if you use the Salbutamol, the Ventolin Accuhaler, which is the dry powder variant, then the equivalent is about two miles in the car. So that's a huge drop down, it's the same drug, and you're dropping down from 200 miles in the car down to about two miles per car. The biggest impact in the environment from Asperan COPD is reliever use. Um, 
um, massively eclipses the preventer type use. So we know that you know, the preventer inhalers to keep you well and the reliever when you, when you have symptoms. So large efforts on changing uh, preventers on, from MDS DPIs or better MDIs only has a small impact. What we really need to look at is can we change our reliever usage? Now, there's two ways of doing that, well, maybe three or four ways of doing that. But the first thing is the better control of asthma and CPD you have, the less you'll need to use the reliever. And that means that, so you won't have to order as many, you won't have to make as many. The next thing is, can you use a better reliever? Um, and there are simple switches like don't use Ventolin anymore because Ventolin by far has the worst of, uh, uh, um, footprint of all the, the salbutamol MDIs. Um, and GSK have no plans at all to change that. So we should just stop using it. And if you prescribe Ventolin, if you prescribe salbutamol as just generic salbutamol, there's a decent chance that the pharmacy might just give you Ventolin. Whereas if you just change that to Salamol or the easy breathe version of salbutamol, which is a dry powder version, then that, that has a massive effect. People request their salbutamol inhaler on their repeat every time, just as a, oh yeah, well, I'll just get another salbutamol, another one, another one. And we all know if you've visited people in their homes that you find drawers just completely full of salbutamol inhalers that they've never opened. Um, and the carbon footprint is it's already done. It, for the majority of that inhaler is already there because you've compressed the gas, you've made the plastic, you've put it all together, you've wrapped it up and you've transported it transported it well for us it's not too far because they're made in Montrose but it's still being transported down the, down the road um, so most of the carbon footprint is already there so taking salbutamol off repeat prescriptions is very helpful or limiting it to only three at a, a couple at a time or maybe one at a time and and having checks on every three months say do you still really need that that's a really useful thing to do there's a lot of archaic um, prescribing that still goes on um, we used to say to everyone with COPD um, you should take your salbutamol inhaler four times a day and you should take two puffs before you do any kind of exercise. Um, but we don't do that anymore. And that's a huge amount of salbutamol that people are getting, whether they need it or not. So just trying to get out of those, um, out of those prescribing and, uh, and using habits uh, will be very helpful. But this is not straightforward stuff. This is really quite complicated. And what you can't, we mustn't do is just say, right, we should no longer give foster air anymore because it's got a high carbon footprint and it's an MDI and it's bad. Many, for many people, that will be the best treatment for them. For many people, it might be the only inhaler they can take because they can't use a DPI. They may have tried other things and, it's, uh, and it doesn't work. And that is genuinely the best thing for them. But that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't try. Um, and so what we're, we're trying to do, we're about to publish some prescribing uh, guidance on a national basis, which has an entire chapter of, on green prescribing, um, which is perhaps a bit of a jingoistic uh, sort of title, but I think it, it encompasses what we're trying to do. And those, it's going to be more awareness about the, the massive difference between MDIs and DPIs. Some guidance about what, what the difference is between different MDIs. And we've, um, in Tayside, we now have a little green pair of lungs, which we can uh, tag onto the, the better inhalers so that you know instantly that that's one of the, the green prescribing recommended inhalers. So that it makes it straightforward and easy to go, go for the green ones. What we'd like to do is, is to inform our patients about this so that they know why we're doing it and what we're doing. Most people, I think, have some green agenda. It might be small, it might be big, but the more we can do that, we can um, offer people choices. So someone who has new asthma um, and needs maintenance therapy, there's a DPI version available and there's a MDI version available. And if they can use both of them, then we should, we should at least offer them the choice and the reasons why. Um, and perhaps even think that if they're just as good and they are just as good, there's no evidence to suggest that an MDI is better than DPI, then we should push for that. The other thing to remember is that MDIs use, we recommend using them with spaces and spaces are made of plastic and they don't last forever um, and people lose them. And so, so this is a complex situation which we're trying to tease our way through. And I feel that you know, I, I have no influence on the desflurane bit and I'm glad that Pavan does and, they're, and, they're, and then I said it's taking this so seriously. Um, if you want to see some sport, then go onto Twitter and tweet about your love of desflurane. You'll see a, a storm of people. <laughs> um, uh, this is a really hot topic. 
But what I do have influence over is, is, is inhalers. And um, if I could reduce that 4% down to 2% or 1% or less, then that's a massive win and a, and a really big, important thing. If I'll leave you with this, in terms of global warming potential, if you switch all of your MDI, so if you, let's say you're on Foster, which is one of the worst can, uh, culprits, and you're on Ventolin, and you swap to Relvar and an, a DPI um, version of Salbutamol, so that's Ventolin Accuhaler, then you drop your, club, your global warming potential by the same degree as going from a diesel car to electric or becoming completely vegan. So going from a meat predominant diet down to being vegan. So that's the magnitude of change that you can have uh, by switching inhalers. So that's my inhaler chat. Um, and we'll move on to the chat, which I think there are a couple of things. Oh, good, there's a couple of questions. So um, Pete R, is that, Pete, do you wanna say, do you wanna ask your question or am I reading it out for you? He's not there. Uh, so Pete says, I see Australian hospitals are making significant money from their copper waste from theatres and other areas, bipolars, etc. I It feels we are missing something here. Should financial rewards such as this not be available to health boards? Yes, I mean, that, I mean that, that's a really good question because I, I read all those questions on the chat. Um, it makes sense to recycle these wherever possible, but at the moment they all go into sharp spin and then gets incinerated but practical there are practical challenges so you need to create a separate streamline raise awareness um, and start recycling them and find a person who actually can recycle um, these things and, and make something out of it because one of the things people worry about recycling um, is, is the clinical waste um, so they, they always worry about recycling these because it's always worried about infection. But I think that the mentality is changing. Uh, yes, is a simple answer, but practically uh, making it happen is much, much harder because it, it, it's, it's a, a typical example as metal recycling trial that we did. It showed massive benefits, but it was much harder to implement it. And uh, the company which was involved, they went bust when the, um, it, in the last couple of years ago. Uh, so now newer company, they are thinking about doing these and hopefully it will happen. Um, and more and more papers come out uh, uh, on these kind of things. They'll definitely um, address these is my uh, view. But when, that's a, a million dollar question. Uh, does, uh, Robert Ray says, uh, does NHS Tayside have any links to local recyclers of contaminated plastic waste like Project Beacon in Perth? And then gives a link for our use. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, that would be ideal, isn't it? If you can find local people, it, it, it reduces um, the contribution of carbon footprint from transport and travel. But equally, I think these things are done nationally all over Scotland and their national contract. At the moment, the company that does for um, clinical waste management is done by a company called 3DB, um, yeah, which is a Wales-based company, but they have a, a, a plant in, in, in Scotland. So it, it's more with national contract and the dry mixing recycling waste, they all depend on tender. And I think it will probably change um, in the next year or two because the, the uh, contract will be finishing. But it's, yeah, there's a lot of work that happens behind the um, scenes that we don't realize. I mean, it makes sense to use local people, but uh, I don't know how easy it'll be to, it'll be to do the, for all the hospitals in Scotland trying to find uh, somebody local. So we just kind of need to find a balance is what my view. We have the same challenge with re recycling inhalers. They're really complicated to inhale, to, to recycle. They, they, you know, there's a lot of plastic in them, but that's one of the problems. There's multiple types of plastic. So in terms of cost efficiency, it's, it's so expensive to dismantle them all to then recycle them that, that businesses find it difficult to justify. One of the um, issue one of the, the possibilities is that MDIs actually might be easier to recycle because you can recycle the leftover gas. No empty MDI is ever empty. Patients finish it and go, well, but it's always got gas in it. So we could get the gas out of that and it can be recycled into fridges and air conditioning units and things, which there's money in. So, uh, so the financial push is to, to use MDIs and recycle them, whereas the 
I'll push really is to not use MDIs and use DPIs instead. So again, complex behind the scenes of what initially seems like a straightforward question. Leslie says, do you want to, I shall just read it, Leslie? I think Steph actually has mentioned. Oh, sorry, Steph. Um, yes, I should pay, pay attention to my neighbor. Um, should we be informing patients of the environmental impact of treatments as part of the consent process, e.g. choice of anesthesia uh, for the manumetic COP26? Um, gets tricky when it's the use of Entonox, for example, for labor when there's not an obvious alternative. Uh, and some people may be made to feel guilty for choosing something that might work best for them, but is not environmentally sound. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting question because um, I, was, I was speaking to a group of uh, Rotary members who were all septenarians and octogenarians who had some joint replacements. Uh, so when I was speaking to them and highlighting the issue with um, environmental sustainability, uh, they made a valid point. I mean, I, I'll come and say, okay, I want this kind of anesthetic. But if the clinician comes and says, um, in my opinion, that the other one is much safer than this, I won't be able to kind of um, argue with that. But I, I completely agree. I think we need to place the actual facts to patients. Um, when do we do this? I, I'm not sure because these are all time consuming factors and not everybody will be aware of these things. But in an ideal situation, yes, definitely we should say these are the options and this is the, along with the clinical safety, which is the priority um, and patient safety, uh, these are the environmental impact of different treatment that you're getting um, and, and you know, what, what would be okay with you kind of a thing. But you can't do that on the morning or the evening before surgery. So we need to look at it. And uh, uh, Steph makes an important point about Entonox. Um, yes, uh, and when, it, it is a major problem in the hospital because that's where most of the nitrous oxide gets used. But although um, when you compare it to wastage of nitrous oxide, use of Entonox is very, very little because there's something called micro wastage that just leaks out of cylinder uh, into the into ether. So it's uh, we are we are wasting a lot of money, and, and the Scottish government has picked that up, and the nitrous oxide project is going on uh, as as we speak. Um, and uh, I think. Yeah, so that, that, that's kind of my answer. I don't know if anybody else has got any other, there are a couple of anesthetists on the on the team here and the surgeons as well, so if they have any other views. I mean, Tom, do, do you think, uh, do, do you kind of offer the, when you prescribe an inhaler to a patient, do you kind of tell them these are the issues with the environment at the moment? And, yeah, I, uh, I, def I definitely do. Uh, I, I have the luxury that, that I have quite, you know, I have time in a clinic appointment up here. A new asthma patient is half an hour, um, whereas Kevin will have seven minutes to try to get through everything. And, and at the end, oh, by the way, I'm wheezy. So, you know, I, I do have that luxury to be able to do that, but I do. Um, and I've got a, oh, I have a plastic, I'm sorry, it's plastic, but I do have a plastic um, a uh, little basket here with all the different inhalers in them um, and then what we've got is the ones that are good for the environment we put the green sticker on so that we and we say to patients these are the techniques these are the ones that are good for the environment these are less so let's see which ones you can use and, and we'll try and help you choose um, so we do do that but um but the priority is the the best treatment for anyone with airways disease is the inhaler that they can use properly and then the inhaler that they will take so if that turns out to be the one that has a high GWP, then, then that on that single patient basis is the best thing and that's what we give. But if we can shift from 90% bad and 10% good to the other way around, then that's clearly a win. Uh, Leslie says, great, thanks for a great talk and uh, your years of tenacity and hard work, Pava. Uh, I would echo that. A great frustration is that as shop floor folk, we really can only do the recycling bit how can we influence the wider structure so that the reduced bit is addressed better? Specifically, how do we get away from the single use culture and start thinking about less packaging and more reuse of kit? You know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one, of, one of the challenges, isn't it? But I think in, in my view, what the, the, not an easy option, but a, a doable option would be working as a team. So if I take data for, for an example, as a surgeon, as an anesthetist, there's prop staff and there's anesthetic nurse and then uh, theta support workers, orderlies, and then the recovery team. So there are quite a few teams involved. If each team looks into these kind of areas and say, okay, this is where we're using all single use stuff. Can we replace this with something reusable? 
Um, but like like I said, remanufacturing is a is a relatively new concept. It's in the last two three years it's happening. Uh, it's just a simple switch, but I, I think uh, it, it's not happened. Uh, certainly, I, I don't know any surgeon who would want to use it just purely. Although the C marked and the said quality is still not compromised, all those reassurances given. Still, uh, I don't think any of the surgeons are keen to use it yet. But hopefully, there will be some keen surgeons who will just take it and use it and sh show that it really doesn't make a difference. And there are several papers that have come out uh, from sustainability um, uh, team down in Brighton. There's an ENT surgeon and her registrar are doing fabulous work on, on these things. Um, so I think that's one of the ways we can look into uh, increasing the reduced bit and refused bit and get away from single-use culture. I mean, certainly easy option, again, this poly polystyrene cups. If we take it off of the order, uh, nobody can place the order, nobody can bring it to areas of clinical use. That's it, it's a simple solution. But we need some sort of a replacement. But there are plastic cups which can be recycled. We should be just going into it, but it's it's much easier to do, I mean, much harder to do it. It's easier to say, but it's much, much harder to do it because it just, they all happen on some sort of a, um, what do you call, a subclinical or like, like at the brainstem level. So people, when it's finishing, they just order it without thinking much about it. So it's, it's much, much harder to bring it practically unless there's a massive team involved in looking into these kind of things. Uh, final comment from Quentin Gardner is Tiva works well in ENT surgery, and I can I've uh, I all three of my general anaesthetics last year were done under Tiva, so I can support this. Um, can it be used more widely to avoid the inhalational agents? Uh, ab absolutely, Quentin and uh, um, Grant Rodney um, uh, and myself like we've completely converted. Um, I hardly ever use uh, inhalational anaesthetic now. Uh, for any of my patients. And to be fair, TIVA uses can, has gone up. Uh, there are a few challenges like training and being familiar with the kit and um, um, using the drugs appropriately, just like anything else. And for 30 years of using a specific way that's worked well, suddenly if you need to switch to a new thing, it's much harder, which I can appreciate. Um, but I think more and more people have started to use TIVA. Uh, and I think I'm sure more work will come out because there are a few unknowns about TIVA as well in terms of the additives that has been used in propofol. We don't know where it exactly it comes from and the amount of carbon print uh, contribution it has. So I'm sure more data will come out and uh, we'll be able to use it more reliably and safely. But certainly the numbers have gone up. So a fascinating talk recently about propofol use um, and waste of propofol and where it ends up and can you detect it in fish. So perhaps that's perhaps for another day. Uh, Kevin uh, asked me about generic prescribing. I've answered that question in the, in the chat. We're definitely aware, Kevin, about um, the push for generic prescribing for salbutamol um, and, and lots of other inhalers. So we're working on that to make sure that you don't get a slap on the wrist if you specifically say salamol or specifically say Ventolin Accuhaler. So we're, we're, we're aware of that. Right, it is two o'clock. We've used up all the time, Pavan. We were worried that we would we'd fall short, but we're right up to the wire here. Um, thank you so much for your talk and thanks for the input from, from the audience. Thank you for giving me uh, a bit of time to talk about inhalers. I'll, I'll always appreciate that. Next week, we were going to hear um, from the uh, gynae team to talk about um, gynae malignancy. Unfortunately, due to, uh, due to illness, we can't, that has to be postponed. But Kalpana has stepped in. Uh, so she's going to rally the troops and we're going to have a talk about um, the early experiences of robotic surgery. So we had a talk last year about the, the upcoming use of the robot in, in various theatres. Now they've been using it. So it's the initial experience of how good was the robot? What, what um, improvements have we seen in terms of outcomes and recovery? Um, I'm not sure who's going to talk, but it'd be a selection of people, I suspect, from uh, from obstetrics and from urology and head and neck, I think. So look forward to that. I'll send you more information out at the beginning of next week. Thanks everyone for coming, Pavan. Thanks so much for your talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, Thanks, and it'll go up on YouTube when I get the chance. Thanks very much, everyone. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye.